Hello everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to Douglas Week. I'm so honoured uh, and privileged to uh, be here and to talk a little bit about how Black American freedom fighters in 19th century Britain, including Frederick Douglass, campaigned against chattel slavery and, and racism. And what I want to explore in a little bit more detail is how these Black freedom fighters are actually using visual and material culture across the transatlantic to aid their very expansive and extensive lecturing tours here. But to start with, I just want to uh, open with uh, an anecdote because during a anti-slavery meeting in Bromley in London in March 1862, a local, local newspaper correspondent recorded how African-American freedom fighter William Craft, who's pictured here, uh, gave his thrilling account of the escape of himself and his wife from American slavery, he writes. And the correspondent goes on to say, Mr. Craft illustrated his lecture with some very beautiful dissolving views, descriptive of the route through which he passed on his flight from slavery. The cities of Washington, Baltimore, New York and Boston are faithfully and artistically represented. The interior of a railway carriage shows Mrs. Craft in her disguise as an invalid gentleman seated by the side of a friend of her master's who, however, luckily fails to detect her. Another scene shows us Mr. Craft sold by auction at the mart and separated, perhaps forever, from his only sister. So Craft uses a visual form of resistance, a visual form of technology to depict the death-defying escapes escape of himself and his activist wife Ellen Craft from enslavement. This was a, a very popular um, story in the Victorian stage. If you're not familiar with the story, Ellen Craft heroically passes uh, as a white man, performs as a white man, while her, her husband William poses as her enslaved uh, manservant and the escape from uh, Georgia, uh, just outside of Macon in Georgia, uh, across the Christmas period of 1848. But William Craft is giving this lecture in London in 1862. And by the early 1860s, William Craft in particular had been traveling around Britain for over a decade. And he is making use of new technologies, new visual mediums to change his repertoire, to appeal to various audiences who may have heard him lecture, or even if they were obviously seeing him for the first time. And this visual testimony incorporates scenes from their own escape, the city of Boston, where they briefly settled before the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 forces them as refugees over to England. It also includes uh, Ellen Craft's heroic disguise as, uh, as a white Southern man, an image that, again, I don't uh, have an image of, of what William Craft would have showed at this particular evening, but um, we can assume that this image is, is based on the portrait of Ellen Craft that we can see here uh, on uh, on the slide. This is the frontispiece from Ellen and William Craft's autobiographical narrative, Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom, which was published uh, here in London just a couple of years before this speech, actually in, 18, uh, in 1860. And William Craft is also depicting the heartbreaking separation between himself and his sister. And he is showing her, perhaps in these dissolving um, views and by doing so he's making real his own suffering but also paying tribute to memorializing his sister her life her legacy um, given that he um, uh, probably uh, possessed no image of her so William Craft using these dissolving views essentially is complementing it's strengthening his devastating his heartbreaking testimony against chattel slavery and I'm including this particular story in a book I'm writing at the moment, which I've, I've titled Daguerreotypes on My Heart, African-American Visual uh, Performance. And this, this phrase, daguerreotypes on my heart, is taken from a speech by Frederick Douglass, who on his farewell speech in London in 1847, he gazes around his London audience and he pronounces that the scene is so affecting. It was daguerreotypes photographed uh, on his heart. And in this book, <clears throat> I want to try and investigate how black abolitionists were using visual strategies, sometimes visual and literary strategies, how they were both used at the same time alongside each other to inform audiences on this side of the Atlantic 
uh, about chattel slavery, about uh, life in enslavement, how activists, again, like William Craft and numerous others, were paying tribute to the heroism of their family members, the friends that they had um, been forced to leave behind, all to challenge uh, racism and chattel slavery, of course, in the US. And activists like William Craft uh, and many, many others, including Henry Box Brown, James Thompson, Washington Duff, they were employing panoramas, dissolving views, magic lanterns, photography, paintings, uh, drawings, illustrations, and again, combining that with their lectures, their sort of oratory, um, their own um, uh, performances uh, as well. And many of these activists in the 1850s and the 1860s were building on the pioneering work of former Black American freedom fighters like Moses Roper, who as early as the, the late 1830s in Britain was giving lectures, ex extensive lecturing tours around Britain and Ireland, but he was also exhibiting weapons um, of torture. Um, and this he did in nearly every single speech and his pioneering autobiography, which was published first here in the UK, in 1837, that particular narrative includes illustrations um, of his own torture. And this was published and distributed um, uh, in tens of thousands of copies around uh, Britain and Ireland, even included uh, an, an edition completely in Welsh uh, as well in the early 1840s. But these activists, Moses Roper, Henry Box Brown, William Wells Brown, they, in, in particular, when they were using panoramas and paintings, they were challenging very dominant, very white western visual narratives uh, of slavery they're often whitewashed geographical regions like the mississippi if they were displaying panoramas and paintings of um the mississippi in um uh or if white um entertainers essentially were displaying images of the mississippi they normally did not include chattel slavery in it so these black activists are really intervening into this space um, and challenging this erasure of history, of reality, and of course, of slavery. And in doing so, they are telling deeply, deeply personal stories. They're speaking about um, the suffering and the trauma that they um, uh, experienced and witnessed. And this was a really important thing for several audiences, and these visual technologies clearly had a really big impact on British and Irish audiences. And in February 1853, uh, an activist called Turnit Williams, uh, his lecture was, according to the local newspaper correspondent, greatly aided by the exhibition of large panoramic views. His escape into Canada was graphically rendered and the lecture was duly appreciated with a heartfelt sympathy seeming to pervade the audience throughout his lecture. And a few years later, in August 1866, one local newspaper correspondent wrote that James Cheney Thompson's display of several paintings depicting his life in enslavement and, and also his subsequent escape added force to the remarks of the lecturer and enabled the audience more vividly to realize the fearful condition of uh, these slaves. <clears throat> so clearly, according to these newspaper correspondents, having some kind of visual technology alongside the, uh, these speeches are creating a more forceful effect. They are creating uh, a bigger impact. And it wasn't uh, uncommon for the black activists that I've just mentioned. So Turner Williams and, and James Thompson in particular to quite literally paint themselves into their panoramas, their paintings, their illustrations, providing a very visual representation of their own testimony. And again, by painting images of their family members, they're enshrining the memory of those family uh, memories that members they were forced to leave behind and the the struggle to depict or obviously define chattel slavery was a constant battle in the social justice struggle which also represented their own struggles to survive to remember their loved ones to translate that into unblinking fashion to predominantly white audiences who couldn't look away from that lived reality now, there have been so many beautiful and brilliant works by scholars working today on transatlantic visual culture from uh, Professor Celeste Marie Bernier, Marcus Wood, Martha Cutter. It's a brilliant new book called Visualizing Equality by Aston Gonzalez. And all of these scholars um, argue how visual technologies were employed by black abolitionists, but also white abolitionists as well within the anti-slavery movement to explore narratives of freedom, of identity, of citizenship. 
But in this uh, short talk today, I just want to focus on some freedom fighters who aren't necessarily well known, either um, on this side of the Atlantic or uh, in the US. So activists like James Thompson, who really took advantage of very innovative visual technologies to create a narrative of enslavement, um, a narrative of their own enslavement um, in, in uh, Britain during the 19th century. Um, and in doing so, and, and this is one of the problems that I'm, I'm wrestling with uh, in my book, is to try and confront the, uh, the problems and the violences of the 19th century archive as the contributions by activists like James Thompson have been uh, violently erased um, from such spaces. So to give an example, you'd think that there would be uh, potentially a lot of images associated with my, with my talk, with this book that uh, celebrates the, the images and the visual technologies that black abolitionists are employing. And herein lies one of my main problems. The panoramas and the paintings, the illustrations no longer exist. A lot of, or the majority of the sources I have about these visual technologies are in the newspapers. They are through small, very small descriptions in some cases. Um, in the British press, they're written by a male correspondent through a white Western gaze looking upon these visual technologies. So I'm really mindful here of the debates surrounding the desire to try and fill those archival gaps, to recover what is potentially unrecoverable, recoverable, versus the desire to work alongside those silences while still doing justice, of course, to the, the lives I'm trying to represent and trying to write about. And Sadia Hartman and Stephanie Smallwood's work is really important here um, as we try and think through how emissions don't always have to invisibilize black lives, but can show new ways of approaching those gaps and silences. And uh, I draw strength from Celeste Marie Bernier's vision to recover the marks, the traces, the possibles and the probabilities of the lives of survivors in an archive suffering from, she writes, the tyranny of the white written record. So I'm trying to work alongside this archive fractured by violence. And I want to try and gather those scattered traces of black abolitionists like James Thompson and Washington Duff, uh, another activist who have been up to this point ignored, partly because of the privileging of certain stories surrounding the panorama, but because these activists, so far as we know, relied on visual rather than literary strategies. They deliberately chose not to write their story down in an autobiography. Um, and sometimes we tend to privilege those stories um, that are written um, compared to some of the other ways in which black activists were expressing their testimonies and uh, their lives. But let's step back a little bit to focus on why some African-Americans were coming over to Britain throughout the 19th century. And decades throughout that century, black freedom fighters are coming over to Britain and Ireland. Many of them have been born into enslavement. They travel across the Atlantic to lecture about their experiences of chattel slavery, of racism, of white supremacy. They are coming over here to publish their autobiographies and their narratives. They are raising money to purchase enslaved family members, uh, particularly their children, uh, their parents, siblings, and many of the donations that are collected to enact those pur purchases are coming from various types of audiences across Britain, but in a lot of cases, working class audiences, and sometimes even children as well. And what I've tried to do in my research is to try and map as many of these lectures as possible around Britain and Ireland, the, the website is www.frederickdouglasinbritain.com, where I've tried to map where these lectures are taking place. There's uh, nearly 5,000 lectures on this particular map. And as you can maybe make out by the very small picture, black abolitionists were literally traveling to every single corner of the British Isles, all the way up to the Highlands uh, in Scotland, to very rural communities, uh, fishing villages, mining communities, as well as the cities that we might expect. So, of course, London, Manchester, Edinburgh, uh, Dublin, Belfast, um, Birmingham, um, various, various cities, but also small villages and hamlets uh, and very, very small places. And in terms of venues, African-Americans are speaking in churches, chapels, town halls, literary institutions, uh, libraries. They're speaking in mechanics institutions, YMCA halls, um, 
the private parlor rooms of wealthy patrons or country houses, uh, palaces, even school rooms, open spaces and parks, literally anywhere where they can get a hearing. And what I'm trying to do at the moment is work on a visual project. And I've done another talk for, for Douglas Week that goes into this history in a little bit more detail if you're interested. But I'm trying to record as many um, of the sites that actually still exist that hosted a black abolitionist uh, lecture. And obviously many of these sites have been demolished. They've been bombed during World War II. Um, congregations of certain churches have moved away. So those churches have been pulled down, various, various reasons. But of course, there are many sites that still exist there. And these sites, sometimes uh, they're still working churches. Um, sometimes they have been uh, converted into houses and town halls and museums and pubs, even nightclubs. So there's a real range of um, what these sites are um, used for, uh, used for uh, today. And some of these sites as well, um, this particular site on the left hand side is an English heritage plaque, which I was very, very honoured to, um, to help um, create. And this is a former home of William and Ellen Craft. Um, and on the right hand side, just five minutes from the venue, um, uh, William Craft spoke here in 1858, one of those rare occasions where uh, he could probably walk to a venue from his house um, and give a lecture as most of the time he was uh, traveling around the country giving lectures. But I want to also provide a little bit of context because some of the activists like James Thompson, Thompson and Washington Duff, who aren't very well known, they were also um, following in the footsteps of black activists like William Wells Brown and Henry Box Brown, who had toured with an anti-slavery panorama uh, several years um, before them. So, as I mentioned, there were um, panoramas um, organized and uh, created by white artists and white entertainers on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, both sides of the Atlantic that depicted scenes like the River Nile. Uh, the Thames in London, um, events and battles from the Crimean War, cityscapes like Venice, uh, places in Italy, places in Greece, uh, places in India, um, as well as the, the Mississippi. And these panoramas were a very popular form of entertainment, again, on both sides of the Atlantic, but particularly uh, in London. Now, Regardless of the popularity of those performances, there were survivors of chattel slavery like Henry Box Brown, who really shaped the panoramic landscape in the US and in Britain. And to correct very white centered narratives surrounding American history, geography, and those false inaccurate, inaccurate or stereotypical narratives of enslavement that I mentioned earlier, black freedom fighters on British soil used their own lived experiences to infuse their own panoramas about the the hard truths the realities and the brutalities of u.s chattel slavery so we have henry box brown and william wells brown they created their own panoramas successfully traveled around the british isles not together this was separately and they were informing audiences about the reality of slavery and these panoramas were designed to appeal to wide audiences, not those necessarily already invested in the anti-slavery movement or who had an interest in the anti-slavery movement. This was a popular form of entertainment with the panorama. So they're reaching out beyond the realms of those who are already interested. Um, they're harnessing modern or contemporary entertainment and visual methods. And they're using these methods um, to uh, inform audiences about those realities um, of chattel slavery. And Henry Box Brown, he was born into enslavement uh, in Virginia and the image on the left hand side and a very small version of that image uh, exists on this handbill on the right hand side. This image depicts the resurrection, the self liberation um, of Brown from chattel slavery in which he posted himself in a box um, from uh, chattel slavery to uh, freedom, uh, as he wrote it in Philadelphia. And he exhibited this box on both sides of the Atlantic, and he also exhibited this box alongside his anti-slavery panorama, which he toured Britain with for several years throughout the 1850s 
and the early 1860s. And he was constantly changing the paintings on those panoramas to appeal to various different audiences, to include new scenes about what was happening throughout the 1850s, the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin, for example, the Crimean, uh, Crimean War. All of these different scenes were incorporated into his uh, visual uh, panorama. Now, the various iterations of Brown's panorama um, don't exist anymore. We have descriptions with or uh, from archival documents like these handbills, uh, as well as, of course, uh, descriptions from white newspaper correspondence. And we also know that potentially Brown's initial panorama was based on the illustrations from Charles C. Green's 1845 Boston work, The Nubian Slave. So we can perhaps get some idea of some of the scenes that Brown at least initially had on his panorama and what they potentially would have looked like. Now, William Wells Brown began exhibiting a panorama alongside William and Ellen Craft to start with in the early 1850s. And there are no images that exist of Brown's panorama, but Brown was a very prolific activist and author. And we actually have a description of Brown's panorama um, in a pamphlet that Brown wrote himself. So this is a really brilliant, brilliant um, source that we can learn about his own panorama from his from his own hand. And in the preface, William Wells Brown outlines the reason for his creation of the panorama. And he visited a panorama of the River Mississippi in Boston in 1847. And he said, I was somewhat amazed at the very mild manner in which the peculiar institution, so slavery, of the Southern states was there represented. And it occurred to me that a painting with a, a fair representation of American slavery as could be given upon canvas would do much to disseminate truth upon this subject and hasten the downfall of the greatest evil that now stains the character of the American people. So in response to this, Brown collects a number of sketches of plantations um, uh, from the US South. And after considerable pains and expense, I succeeded in obtaining a series of sketches of beautiful and interesting American scenery, as well as of many touching incidences, incidents in the lives of slaves. And these drawings were apparently copied by skilled artists in London. Um, uh, and then Brown toured this particular panorama around, uh, around England. Now, another freedom fighter who has scarcely been written about, Charles Freeman, offers a really interesting comparison to this story, particularly in regards to agency. And this is another aspect of my book that I'm trying to highlight. I'm trying to wrestle with questions of, uh, of agency, how much independence that certain black activists had when they were working with white proprietors of panoramas, for example, when Freeman's is a case in point. And we have a case here with Charles Freedom. This is a black freedom fighter who was lecturing alongside a panorama in 1850, which was controlled by a white American, so W.H. Irwin. And he possibly authored uh, an early edition, um, a narrative edition of Freeman's life. So how did Freeman exert his, his agency and authority during a, a short speech given alongside this panorama? How much literary, literary agency did he have over his particular narrative? So the life of Charles Freeman, once an American slave in 1850, this is on the left-hand side, it was published in London and it was uh, printed in conjunction um, with the panorama. So this narrative was on sale uh, for audience members. They would go and watch the panorama and then they could have a choice to buy Freeman's narrative afterwards. This was a very short description of Freeman's life. It was based on some of the experiences that Freeman was asked to relate during his very brief speeches alongside the, the panorama. But unfortunately, and, and tragically and very deliberately, again, when we're thinking about how to work with the archive, newspaper adverts for this panoramic exhibition either completely erase Freeman from the performance or make a very tiny mention that uh, a, quote, fugitive slave will give a brief lecture alongside the panorama to confirm that essentially these images that we're seeing or the audience we're seeing uh, was truthful. And we don't have a lot of records of the speeches that he was giving, but clearly his presence there, the speeches that he was giving um, was sort of anchoring that panorama to his own experience. And he uses that limited time on stage to offer a counterpoint to the images designed by a white abolitionist. And his narrative does that as well. But really interestingly, three years later, so um, 
years after Freeman had actually um, left this particular working relationship and he's no longer giving speeches alongside this panorama, Freeman actually writes his own narrative, The Escaped Slave, which you can see here on the right hand side, which was published in 1853. And he's finally able to express his authority over his own story, his own life. And this is a longer, a far more detailed work, uh, volumes of emotion, philosophy, heroism, resistance against chattel slavery that he writes about here. And we learn more about Fre Freeman himself, his loved ones, the bravery of family members like Aunt Sarah, who was crucial in trying to uh, enact his liberation from chattel slavery. He's paying respect to black freedom fighters in the marine communities in the, the swamps of uh, Virginia and North Carolina, for example. And this narrative also gives us clues to his potential difficult relationship with Irwin, the proprietor of that anti-slavery panorama and his life after financial ruin actually caused Irwin to return to the US. So this is a really interesting opportunity to learn more about uh, Freeman and this very pioneering work. And we know that from this book that Freeman was, was born into enslavement in, in Virginia. He never knew his, his parents. Uh, unlike the, this first book, this first narrative, which is very short, in this 1853 version, uh, Freeman names his siblings, Jane, John and Mary. And he talks about the horrific separation between himself and those siblings that he never um, sees again. He talks about how chattel slavery affects his um, mental health. He talks about how he tries to escape chattel slavery several times he's finally able to uh, escape um, and settles in New York he's supported by the black community there that essentially help him um, get a position on a steamship that travels from New York all the way to England and that's how he meets Irwin who essentially asks him to um, be part of this traveling panoramic e exhibition so there's a lot more information there um, where we learn that before Irwin essentially asks him or hires him, again, don't quite know, to be part of this performance, Irwin submits Freeman to some very invasive questioning to, uh, which was standard for white abolitionist practice when they were talking with uh, a survivor of chattel slavery. And essentially when Irwin is satisfied that Freeman is who he says he is, so essentially a survivor of chattel slavery, he then makes him an offer about the panoramic ex exhibition. But Freeman's book is, of course, a very stunning, very long forgotten masterpiece, essentially. But how do we wrestle with recovering other freedom fighters who made the intellectual, the philosophical, the philosophical, the, the philosophical decision to spurn white Western literary practices and completely rely on visual strategies instead of writing their stories down in autobiographies. As I've mentioned, we can only access descriptions of these panoramas and paintings through newspaper reports that are edited, that are written by white male newspaper correspondents. How do we begin to understand the resistance strategies employed by a lot of these um, liberators if we can't fully access their artistry, their agency. So again, this is just a question um, that uh, I'm constantly wrestling with. And James Cheney Thompson is, again, another example of this. And rel he relied on panoramas, painting and poetry. He composed his own poetry as well on the British stage to illustrate his lectures. And Thompson's Radical performances have been unforgivably erased from history, again, reminding scholars to confront, work with, attempt to fill those gaps in the archive by piecing together as much biographical information from a variety of different sources as possible to, to really try and restore uh, part of Thompson's identity. And Thompson declares in one speech that he was born into enslavement just outside of Warrington in Virginia. Uh, he, like many, um, uh, of enslaved people he never knew the date of his birth again because of the dehumanizing practices of chattel slavery he makes repeated escape attempts he is briefly enslaved uh, in cuba and new orleans but he manages to um, enact his own uh, self-liberation he settles in canada and new york very very briefly before traveling to liverpool in the early 1860s thompson lectured throughout Wales in 
the early summer of 1865, we're jump, jumping a few years ahead. Uh, and according to the local newspaper correspondent, uh, Thompson lectured with magnificent paintings on which were depicted scenes through which he passed in his attempts to escape. And he spoke in front of some well-executed drawings which made the subject the more interesting and presented many matters in a much plainer aspect that words could do unaccompanied by any picture. And he talks about in these uh, in his speech and also shows in his images the separation between himself and his mother, uh, relating how she would have rather followed them all to the grave than have them snatched away from her, never to see them uh, anymore, he says. And he says in this speech it was impossible for him to describe this scene, perhaps why he had actually painted it, because he found it difficult to relay, he says, the cries of distress that escaped from the fathers and mothers and children as they were torn away from each other forever. And despite his relentless searching for his family who were all sold away to different enslavers, he had heard nothing. And when he spoke about this heartbreaking testimony, he produced an image of a slave auction for the audience to see, to reinforce that pathos, to provide a visualization to the audience. Um, and as the enslaved as well were, were marched to a jail as he's recounting that story, he adds another illustration to exhibit that, uh, again, reinforcing that pathos. And What's interesting about Thompson is that he continues to exhibit these paintings and these illustrations long after the Civil War had finished. He is lecturing with these panoramas and paintings in, 1880, in 1866 and 1867 to remind audiences that uh, Black freedom fighters were still fighting for their freedom. And I wanted to show this particular image as this is where James C. Thompson spoke. It's now a theatre, but it was a former corn exchange in Basingstoke in Hampshire uh, in 1866. And the local newspaper correspondent actually misspells Thompson's name. So again, another, uh, we get more evidence of all the recovery work that scholars are called on to perform when excavating the lives and contributions and the testimonies of um, black activists in the, in the British archive. And according to this local newspaper correspondent, however, Thompson displayed a number of paintings depicting the various scenes through which he's passed as a slave and his attempts to escape. And this correspondent actually includes some of them. So he says, the sale and separation of the lecturer's family when he was six years old, uh, the interior of a slave ship, a whipping machine at Richmond, escape in the woods. Now, unfortunately, what the correspondent does is after recounting some of these scenes, he writes, escape into the woods, et cetera, et cetera. So, while the etc to us as scholars is further evidence again of a damning archive, if that correspondent had written every um, single scene or illustration, we would have had obviously a greater understanding of what Thompson was doing. We have a little bit more information than we did have, um, regardless, a little bit more information about um, Thompson himself and also how he was displaying um, these images. And we know enough of Thompson's previous paintings and of his activism to know that he included scenes um, of his own torture with devices like a whipping machine, which he'd actually exhibited separately at another lecture. So if these paintings remained the same, he could have exhibited the machine together with an image of himself being tortured alongside it, a very radical form of artistry and agency that demonstrated his own survival despite the odds, his commitment to the anti-slavery cause and his determination to inform audiences about the realities of chattel slavery. Now another scene uh, reportedly depicted in these paintings was, again I'll quote from a newspaper report, the extraordinary mode of escape attempt by Mr Thompson uh, alongside the exhibition of weapons of torture uh, which were used upon him after uh, numerous unsuccessful attempts to try to reach Canada and sometimes in a lot of these coverage uh, these coverages there uh, aren't necessarily specifics um, uh, provided but we do know in one of Thompson's escape attempts he tried to escape while climbing on top of a railway carriage uh, on a moving train um, so it's probable and, and that he would have depicted that um, uh, terrifying scene um, within his uh, panorama. But again, throughout 1866, Thompson is still exhibiting his panorama. So again, in Hampshire, so not too far from, from Basingstoke in Odaham, Thompson illustrated uh, these lectures but with paintings showing the ill usage and cruelties connected with the slave trade. And the lecturer gave a lucid description of the treatment and abuses of slavery and also the manner in which he escapes. And again, a few months later, he's still exhibiting 
uh, images. And interestingly, the newspaper correspondent here says these images were executed by himself. So this seems to imply that Thompson himself was actually the artist. So not only is he exhibiting these paintings, but he's actually creating some of them uh, as well, which is uh, hugely interesting and exciting and shows um, that uh, the sort of connection um, between resistance and visual testimony uh, on um, the British soil. And, and lastly, Thompson was not only uh, exhibiting a panorama, he was also exhibiting paintings, the standalone paintings. And there's one newspaper correspondent that talked about uh, Thompson exhibiting two paintings. And this, this correspondent writes, uh, the paintings depict Thompson as he was with his wrist and ankle secured by a chain and very badly clad and Thompson as he is well dressed and seated in a snug English parlour. So if Thompson was an artist, it's possible that these are self portraits of himself um, with showing the transition between being uh, in enslavement and being uh, in freedom um, in, in Britain. Again, that, uh, that narrative can obviously be complicated, but this is what he's showing in his images. So he's a very revolutionary artist. He's championing his own sort of artistic agency uh, and legacy. And obviously speaking to British audiences, there is an element of what Alan Rice calls strategic Anglophilia. So flattering British audiences in that now Thompson had reached complete uh, freedom and safety in Britain and again as I say we know that's not necessarily true we can complicate those narratives um, but it's an interesting um, story that is told through um, these particular uh, images. But finally I just want to mention a couple of other activists so Washington Duft is another activist who has suffered a similar fate um, to James Cheney Thompson he's not written about in contemporary scholarship he was born into enslavement in Kentucky to Thomas and Oni Duff in 1829, and he managed to uh, escape to Canada via the Underground Railroad, and he possibly arrived in Britain around 1860. I'm not sure of the exact date yet, but he lectures throughout the uh, mid uh, and late 1860s about chattel slavery, and he illustrates his lectures with uh, paintings illustrating his own torture and also weapons of torture uh, more broadly and uh, it's really important of course we honour him and again very much like William Craft Washington Duff, Duff is illustrating his own sister um, in a lot of these paintings and illustrations that he's exhibiting so he's honouring and memorialising the family members he's forced to leave behind. So the research for this book has been sometimes very surprising very fascinating and as I make my way through sort of my mini archive if you like of Victorian newspaper articles I'm constantly finding more and more examples of how black freedom fighters were using so many different forms of, of imagery to win support from um, from these audiences and the their families their loved ones that they spoke of were of course not abstract or imagined or fictionalized they were living breathing or they had once lived and breathed and by highlighting their their memories activists are really enshrining the stories of their loved ones and therefore in their audience's memories as well and during a lecture in 1860 the reverend william troy who was an activist and freedom fighter who worked in canada he lectured on the experiences of, of fleeing freedom seekers um, from u.s soil to canada and he actually ends his lecture with, according to the newspaper correspondent, an exhibition of a number of photographic likenesses of some of his relatives and fugitive brethren. And no doubt spurned on by sort of seeing these images, the collection, the donations from audience members to support this community in Canada was really very generous. And this uh, meeting was held to raise money to build a chapel and a school for, um, for freedom seekers. Um, so over uh, nearly four pounds was, was raised, um, which, which again is quite a considerable amount of money, particularly when um, some of his audience would have been working class um, or from working class backgrounds. So uh, this is a really, really significant um, event. And actually by showing those images, um, he's able to connect with his audience in, in, in different ways. And as the, the pioneering and the brilliant historian Richard Blackett has shown as well, John Seller Martin, the abolitionist who visited Britain several times, he actually relied on images of his sister and children um, to um, uh, raise money, not only for their liberation, um, but uh, that liberation 
or I should say the liberation of his sister and, and her children um, included this sort of visual um, testimony as well as his own uh, testimony uh, and oratory that he was um, lecturing when he was lecturing in Britain uh, and Ireland as well. And there were other activists who used other forms of visual culture and visual material culture as well. So some activists used woodcuts and again, various forms of illustrations, but also maps. And we began with William Craft, so I will end with William Craft. And during one meeting in 1855, William Craft actually gives a lecture in front of a map of the United States uh, and the, the US South or the, the states um, that were tainted um, by enslavement, uh, as many activists described it, they were actually painted in black. Um, so he's giving this lecture and he's pointing to this map with this kind of black area um, that sort of gave this impression, obviously, of, of, of um, darkness uh, and sin, because that's what was happening um, on a daily basis, torture and death. And he uses his personal experience, the dramatic and um, death-defying escape of himself and his activist wife, Ellen Craft, from Escape. He's telling that story while pointing and referring um, to this map, as well as just showing the sheer distance, the 1,000 miles they had to travel um, from Georgia um, to Philadelphia. So just to finish up, whether activists were using paintings, uh, exhibited photographs, uh, using visual strategies, they were... Uh, trying to convince British and Irish audiences about the realities and the brutalities of chattel slavery and in doing so they told very hard truths about what was going on in the US. They were challenging contemporary and popular narratives that erased um, uh, or um, whitewashed certain stories and of, or geographical spaces around the US and in doing so, they were obviously recounting very personal, very traumatic memories. They were enshrining the memory of those family members who they left behind, as I've already mentioned. So including these visual technologies and these visual mediums as part of this international philosophy that they were, that these Black freedom fighters were um, organising uh, and speaking about on British soil is a really, really important part of the transatlantic um, story that we're uh, trying to tell and despite a lot of the invisibilization of these black freedom fighters in the archive the, the devastating gaps that um, surround our knowledge uh, in the archive around their testimony that doesn't necessarily mean that um, uh, we can uh, ignore their lives their lives their testimonies their contributions to the social justice movement um, is a really really important and um, hugely hugely uh, in, important um, venture and again just recognizing some of these sites that I'm showing you today and have showed you today they are visual monuments to their heroism uh, and essentially their um, their roles as warriors in the social justice cause so thank you so much for listening uh, to me today I hope you've enjoyed the talk and I hope you continue to enjoy the the rest of Douglas week thank you so much <laughs>